to move in our midst. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Messiah Yeshua, and put no confidence in the flesh. Mm. No confidence in the flesh. Our own humanity is a stumbling block which keeps us from ascending to that high place where we can just be in the presence of the living God. Imagine, like Moshe, like Elijah, like Yeshua, imagine like James and John and Peter who were given the privilege of ascending and seeing the glory of our Lord, of seeing Moshe and seeing Elijah on that holy mountain. Imagine having an experience like that. Can we experience that each day? We are the circumcision who worship God in spirit. We rejoice in Yeshua and we put no confidence in the flesh. The flesh being our humanity. What makes us human is we have the capacity to reason things out, to question, to doubt, Our reasoning, our questioning, <sighs> there was a time when philosophy was everything to this young man. And I wanted to be a philosopher who wrote brilliant poetry. Paul was in Athens and he saw that the people were very religious and the people of Athens would spend their day just philosophizing, waiting around to see and to hear something new. Some new philosophy, some new ideology, some new. We are not to be tossed by every wind of doctrine. Some new thing, some new philosophy, some new way of looking at things. There's nothing new under the sun. So as we open up our hearts and allow the Holy Spirit to move within us, Spirit of God, hallelujah. Aruch, Chodesh, Holy Spirit. Live, walk, be led by the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? And where will the Spirit lead us now? Today. Isn't it awesome that we, who are the circumcision, can experience God daily as we worship and serve our God in the Spirit? because we put no confidence in the flesh, because how many of us know that the flesh will not allow us to endure? And the blessedness of this faith that we are to live is that we endure to the end, but our endurance is short-lived because being human, we are moved by our emotions. We respond to the conditions and to the circumstances and the winds of change. If you don't believe me, <laughs> let's take a look at Washington, D.C. Wow, how many philosophers do we have running this country? How many politicians lie to the people and the people fall for it and they vote? Don't we 
just love our democracy. That if we don't like our president, we can replace him. Democracy, I love it. The problem with the majority rule is that if the people don't want Jesus, if the majority of the people are ungodly because they have been swayed by whom? The philosophers, the poets, and the things that they write. Imagine. What made Athens so religious that they erected altars to every god on the planet and even a god that was unknown? And yet, Shaul, that great rabbi of old who had a supernatural encounter with Yeshua, whose life had been turned upside down, hallelujah, imagine! What is possible when you could be educated like Shaul at the feet of Gamaliel and yet, for all that, be able to say, what was gained is lost. Because I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord. How many of us want the knowledge of the truth? The world is always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The truth will set you free, Yeshua said. Yeshua said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit, they are life. The flesh profits nothing. So why are we going to put our confidence in the flesh? How do you educate the flesh? Through education. How do you educate the flesh? Through human reasoning. How do politicians prepare? for their political speeches? Do they humble themselves before God? Give me the words to say to the people. No. Polished speeches are the result of learned men who are speech makers, speech writers. And the words that they speak to the people win the heart of the people. It's called rhetoric. And you see rhetoric, you can study it, you can learn it. You know who was a good public speaker? Adolf Hitler. And they voted him to power. And he became the Fuhrer. And he proceeded to carry out a campaign of genocide. And six million Jews perished but that's what the people wanted. That's what the people cried for. It was like the chance in Jesus' day. Pilate was ready to release him. But the people called for a murderer. Barabbas, give us Barabbas. And they were being stirred by the religious leaders who were not in any way moved by the Holy Spirit, but moved by their own selfish, ambitious plots. Has anything changed? Do we not see that in today's world? Why do we marvel? Why? Why are we shocked at what we're seeing happening in our own country? How ungodliness is spreading. It's a global crisis. What is the crisis? The heart of the people is moving further and further away from God. Further and further away from the truth. <clears throat> Imagine what it was like that day when the masses of people who were shouting all that the Lord our God says, we will hear and be obedient. And Moshe is on the mountain 40 days. And what is he receiving? Two tablets of stone written by the finger 
of God. And he has the tablets of stone. But there is something going on among the masses of people who have been left under the leadership of Aaron. Mm -hmm. There's no way the people's heart can turn away from God so quickly when you have a priestly leader like Aaron. But what happened? But you had in Aaron was a coward. He was a brilliant speaker. Matter of fact, he was the speaker, the mouthpiece for Moshe. Mm -hmm. But it was Moshe on that mountain who was experiencing God in a supernatural way. So with all of his rhetorical brilliance, what went wrong? And how did the people corrupt themselves so quickly and where was the religious leadership that was left in charge of the people? My question today is, where is the religious leadership today? Then in our great nation, America, the heart of this country is going so far away from God. But Moshe, came down from that mountain. But before he came down from that mountain, he pleaded for the people. Because who told him to go down? God did. You see, when you worship God, when you serve God in the spirit, you are in tune to what the spirit is saying. At that very moment, the very pulse He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Seven times in the Apocalypse. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And these were the letters that were sent to the churches of the Apocalypse because perilous times are coming and there is one who will rise up and be the people's leader it is the spirit of antichrist why should we be shocked that the world is under the sway of the evil one because there is a spirit but it's not the spirit of god so open your hearts a little bit deeper hear what the spirit is saying because the Holy Spirit speaks today, but not everybody's hearing it. Paul said this, in demonstration of the Spirit and of the power of God. That's how we preach. Why? Because if we come with rhetoric, if we study philosophy so that we can put together good messages, then what are we giving the people? Because you see, philosophical systems, political ideologies, they change and shift with the winds. And if the people are moved by the masses, what we will have is another idolatrous event like the one that stirred Moshe with a holy anger to break the tablets. Why would Moshe break the tablets? Aren't they holy? Why would he throw them and the fragments would scatter around? What would move him to want to do such a thing? Let's gather up the fragments that nothing would be lost. Do you know churches are built around relics? And people come from all over the world to worship a relic. Open your heart. What did Yeshua say? 
What I whisper in your ear, shout from the rooftops. What you hear in the dark, shh. Declare it in the light. Because you see, when we move by the Holy Spirit, we have those experiences on the mountaintop, like Moshe, like Elijah. Imagine what's possible even today, as we look to a future, an eternity with him. He dwells amongst us now. Get a taste of the Lord today. Bask in his presence. Walk in the very shadow of the Almighty. That's what we have now. That's what we have today. And if more people move and breathe and have their being in the spirit of God, what kind of world do you think this would be? Like the Athens of Paul's day, I perceive that you are very religious because there are religious institutions all over the place. Wars are being fought in the Middle East over religion as to which religion will rule the land. Will it be Islam? Will it be Judaism? Will it be Christianity? Well, Christianity has its rule here in America. We're one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. But is that what's really going on in our world today. Open your hearts and hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. Moshe, why did he break such a holy work of God? Why? What does this symbolize? What do we learn in our parasha today? There is the parasha. Rachel, Ki, Tisa. What does that mean? Ki, Tisa. What does that mean? What does it mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to us? And what is the definition of Tisa? Basically, take account, take a census. Take account, take a census? It's the first few words of the Parsha. Yeah. Imagine. Or when you take, I guess the next word is the census, but when you take. When you take what? When you take what? You see, there were new tablets home. Home! Out two tablets of stone like the first ones which you broke. And what will God do? What will he do? He will write on new tablets of stone the commandments that were revealed to all of Israel. What does God do when we open our hearts to him? What does he do? He writes his Torah on the tablets of our heart. And in our minds, he puts them. And what is the Torah in your heart and in your mind going to do? It's already in you. So what is the Holy Spirit going to do with the words that are written on the tablets of your heart? That's the revelation that we live and walk by daily. You see, Moshe interceded for the people 
because God was ready to destroy the entire nation for their idolatry. We had a priest in charge, but the priest could not restrain the people. The people were demanding a new God, another God, a false God, a God of gold. And the people took their wealth, and what came out of the fire was an idol. And the idolatry of the people would lead them back to captivity. Why? Because this man, Moshe, delayed his return. Do you know we're waiting for the return of the Messiah? We're waiting for Moshiach to come. And what is he going to do when he returns on this earth? What is he going to do? Where is he going to dwell? What is he going to accomplish? that 2,000 years of church history has not been able to accomplish. <clears throat> he will bring on an age where righteousness will be the standard. And the law will come out of Zion and all the world will worship the true and living God. We, who are the circumcision, worship the true and living God. We worship him in spirit. We worship him in truth. And where do we find the truth? In Yeshua. And who will lead us into all truth? The Holy Spirit. The triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. How many have God in you? Every hand should be raised up. Every heart should be opening up to the God who dwells within us. Like Shaul said, it is I who have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ Jesus lives in me. He lives in me. He lives in you. He lives in us. So every one of us, every moment and minute of our day, now in this present time, can experience those mountaintop experiences like Moshe. We can experience God like Elisha. Turn with me now to Mark's gospel. Turn with me now to Mark chapter 9. Turn with me to that moment in our biblical history when Yeshua was on the mountain. And three of his disciples were with him. And they were eyewitnesses of his glory. And they heard the divine voice of God speaking from the heavens. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And they were eyewitnesses. Moshe was on that mountain with Yeshua. And Elijah was on that mountain with Yeshua. What does that tell you? Hmm? Moses died on Mount Nebo. According to tradition, there was a battle going on for his body. Why? Where is he buried? Where can we erect a shrine? Build a church where Moses was buried. Where is Moses? Well, he's not there. Where's Moses? In heaven. And Elijah? Wow. Moses died. Elijah did not see death. Elijah was raptured. <laughs> 
Raptured from where? Where was he raptured from? You can say it. Where did he ascend? He was on Mount Nebo. Nebo. What was he doing on Mount Nebo? Talking with God. Talking with God. You want to get to Mount Nebo now? It's over there by Yukaipa. <laughs> that big, highest peak up there. Listen. We can have that mountaintop experience when we open our hearts and our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. Because you see, the wind of change and all the rhetoric and all the speeches and everything, you got to tune that chatter out and tune into what the Lord is saying. Chapter 9, verse 1 says, And he said to them, Assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Hallelujah. It's true. There are those in the church that are not going to see death. They're going to go up in the rapture. They're going to experience what Elijah experienced in being taken up. They're going to see the glory of the Lord. They're going to experience the power of God in a supernatural way. That's what the church is telling the world. We're only here for a short while, then we're gone. The question is, when will we depart from this earth? Some of us want it to happen now because... May it happen before this election. Because I'm not really interested to see who the next president's going to be because I lost <laughs> confidence in our government years ago. Because every year they lie to us and every year it gets worse and worse and worse. So enough with your empty promises. Enough with your politics. Enough with your fake religion. Because religion and politics is about as toxic as that day when they were shouting to release a murderer and send the innocent to the slaughter. Are we not seeing that today? Hmm? The world does not want righteousness. It wants to continue in its wickedness, in its deceit. And people don't want to hear the truth, they want to hear the lie. And they want the rhetoric, and they want what tickles their ears. Give us a God who will lead us back into captivity, into bondage. There are some here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain, apart by themselves. Why didn't he take all 12 of his disciples? Why didn't he take all the followers? Why these three? Hmm? Why these three? Why, why choose only three of all the people that were following Jesus? I'm sure there were great multitudes of people who were following Jesus. Once again, it's God's choice. And so, they went up, and they went up by themselves, and they saw what? He was transfigured right before them. His clothes were shining, exceedingly white, like snow. And what? They saw Elijah. They saw Moses. And Elijah and Moses were talking with Jesus. You know what that says to me? 
Moses is alive. Elijah is alive. Jesus is alive. And I wonder if they're still talking today. I'd like to sit in on their conversation because I can learn a lot. These three, James and John and Peter, they were listening. They were amazed. They were experiencing what everyone else is not experiencing. And so, Peter, he answers and he says to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here and let us make three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moshe, and one for Elijah. Hmm. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Who didn't know what to say? Peter? Well, then why don't you say nothing? Why Peter would say something? But he was afraid. He was afraid. See, we want to do something. Because we see what's happening in our world. We want to do something. We want to make a difference in our world. To cool Olam. We want to fix the breach. We want to repair the world. If you think your politicians in Washington are going to repair the world. Yeah, right. If you think the religious leaders of the world are going to repair the world. Yeah, right. There's only one. Who can repair the world? And that is Jesus himself. And Jesus, he's alive. And he lives in you and in me and in us. He indwells his ecclesia. He indwells his church. You would think the church has the power of God to turn the world upside down. Instead of just waiting for the Messiah to come, let's do something that will manifest his glory. Is that what Peter had in mind, Rochelle? Is that what Peter had in mind? Let's build three tabernacles. Let's build another church. Let's make more buildings. Let's do more of this. Let's do that. What was the divine response? Verse 7 tells us that a cloud came and overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in do what? Hear him. Hear him. Hear him. What does that say? Israel had already been given the prophecy by Moshe himself that God would raise up a prophet like himself. And that prophet, you must do what, Rochelle? Hear, O oh Israel. This Jesus is the Moshiach. He is the son of the true and living God. And we're not ashamed to tell you that. Hear him. Does Jesus speak today? Yes, he speaks through his preachers. He speaks through his prophets. Does Jesus speak through the philosophers and the poets of the world? Because if you turn to the philosophers and the poets, what you're going to get is good literature. But Paul even used the quote from one of their poets. that day when he was speaking before the people. Open your hearts. 
even deeper. And hear what the Spirit is saying. You see, Peter had a great idea, but that was out of fear, out of being afraid. It's good that we're up here, but hey, let's build a tabernacle. But how many have heard the voice of God speaking out of the clouds? And I'm not talking about Google on the cloud. Everybody's fascinated with artificial intelligence. Those, it's coming from, from heaven. It must be good. Ask me anything. I'll create it for you. And everybody's praising AI. You know what that tells me? That they've come to realize that man's intelligence is limited. We have to go beyond human intelligence. And let's create artificial intelligence and let's let let's say AI become the new god of this age who will give us wisdom and counsel and tell us what we should do you know what that's going to lead the people back to captivity we know that's coming we know it's already here and the world is praising it matter of fact the world is worshiping it but thank God we're not of this world. So, the cloud overshadows them. The voice of God speaks and they heard it. The apostles that, that were eyewitnesses of his glory, of his majesty, testified that they heard the voice of God speaking. God the Father was giving testimony regarding his son Yeshua. He is my beloved son. Hear him. He's the one we should be hearing. He's the one that we need to be tuned into daily. Now, what happened? When they had looked around, they saw no one anymore but only Jesus with themselves what happened to Moses what happened to Elijah what happened when it's all said and done the only one that is going to stand with us when everyone else has abandoned us is Jesus only and isn't Jesus all we need? Yeah. He's all we need. He's all we need. And this Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Because like Moses and like Elijah, who these three saw, and they were eyewitnesses, and they wanted to build tabernacles for them. <laughs> Think. The only one left standing with them was Jesus. And the day would come when Jesus himself would ascend into heaven. Into the cloud. And he was carried away into heaven to be seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And we are waiting for him to return just like he ascended. Hallelujah. You know what that tells me? That the popular vote that day that voted him to be executed was overruled by whom? By whom? By God himself. And if God is for you, who can be against you? What can man do? Nothing. So we say once again, we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. And why in the spirit? Because that's the only way that we can serve him in truth. 
Because if we lean on our own understanding, if we allow our own human reasoning, and if we think that our intellect is going to ascend us to that heavenly realm, think again. In the flesh, no one can please God. It's impossible. And so, Jesus, with his three, and as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen. Was that a gag order? You see, one of the things that we want to do is tell everybody right away what the Lord has shown us. The majority of people won't believe what you have witnessed with your own eyes, what you have heard with your own ears, that spiritual experience they had on the mountain. Isn't that what Moshe was experiencing on the mountain with God? What revelation he received. And what about Elijah? What revelation he received. And now these three apostles were commanded to say nothing. Nothing, nothing, until when? Until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. In every crowd, there is a Peter. In every crowd, there is a James and there is a John. And these three had different personalities, didn't they? What kind of preacher was Peter? What about James? What about John? Remember, James and John were brothers. But before Jesus, these three were business partners. You know that? They, they, they were fishermen by trade. Hallelujah. And we'll go more into detail about fishers and men because it's been prophesied in the latter days that, that the Lord is going to send out the fishermen. He's going to gather Israel. So we don't find a lot of fishermen right now in the churches because their task is to gather the children of Israel from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And do what? Get them out and assemble them where? In the, in the land, in preparation for who's coming? The coming of Mashiach, the coming of the Messiah, because something has to happen before Messiah comes. So the fishermen have to be sent out. The question is, who are they? And it's amazing that he took three fishermen up there. The ones he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You see, your call to Jewish missionary work is for the few, not for the masses of people that sit in churches every week. And I know we get excited because we want to tell them all, but don't do that. Focus on the mission and stay within the parameters of what the Lord has commanded you. Until the Son of Man rises from the dead.
Tell no one. So they kept this word to themselves. That's hard for us, many Israel. Rochelle and I, we don't shut up. We want to say everything to everybody. We get excited with all of the, the experiences that we have when we are by ourselves with the Lord. Because that's where you're going to get your instruction. When you're alone with the Lord. Not when you're around the crowds. But when you're just, the only one there is Jesus. And here it is. They kept the word. But what were they doing? Questioning. What is this word questioning? They were reasoning. Questioning. Hmm. Questioning. And what were they reasoning? What were they questioning? What the rising from the dead meant. Wow. What do you mean? Help me here. What does rising from the dead mean? This resurrection must be something so powerful that Paul himself says, everything that I learned in Judaism, everything that, 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 that I thought was gained to me, it is done. It goes to the sewer. For the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus the Lord. And what was his aim? What was his goal? That he may experience the power of the resurrection of Christ. How many of us know that the power of God raised Jesus from the dead? And what role did the Holy Spirit have in raising up Jesus from the dead? Holy Spirit power. Not everybody believes that Jesus is alive. Not everybody believes that he rose from the dead. There, there, is, there is a great movement of the historical Jesus as a man who was born, who lived, and who died on the cross and was buried somewhere. But today we don't know. And that's what they're questioning. What do you do when you have questions? Lord, I hear so much about a rapture. When will these things be? And Lord, what should we do to prepare for it? What is the Lord going to say? What is he going to answer you? You know, in Jeremiah 33, 3, what does it say? Call to me. I'll answer you and I'll show you great mighty things you don't know. If you want to know something, if you want to know more, you go to the Lord himself. Because the Lord himself will teach you. The Lord himself will instruct you. The Lord himself will lead you and guide you because he is the spirit. The spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit that will lead you to those high places like these three who were eyewitnesses to the glory of the Lord and what they saw, they wanted to report it, they wanted to shout it from the mountaintops, but no. And they asked him, saying, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? What does Elijah's coming have to do with the Lord raising up? So what do we have here? 
Lord, Jesus, you said this. But the scribes say that. Do we still have that problem today? Rochelle? Do we still have that problem today? What is the problem? Do we listen to the Lord? Or do we listen to the scribes? Who were the scribes? Weren't they the learned of the law? Weren't they the theologians of the day? They say this, but you say that. Then he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first. So the scribes, well, they got it right. He is coming. Elijah's coming. Elijah is coming. Why would that be important to us in our work? What would that be important to us? So here's the question. Have we seen Elijah come already? Are we going to see Elijah the way James and John and Peter saw Elijah that day? Could it be these two witnesses we read in the apocalypse is Moshe and Elijah? And what are they doing? What is their mission? Why are they coming first? Why, why is this going to happen first? The answer is right here in front of us. He must come first. And do what? Restores all things. What precedes the coming of Moshiach is the restoration. And what restoration is being referred to here? And here is where I'm going to ask Rochelle. What restoration is Jesus talking about? Turning hearts back to the The heart of Israel back to the heart of the fathers yes. of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what needs to happen. So, isn't it a great time to be involved in Jewish missionary work? Amen. A ministry that is directed toward Israel and the scattered among the nations? Because Yeshua said, he who gathers with me, but he who does not gather with me scatters. Which side? Do you want to be on the side that scatters Israel or the side that gathers Israel? Yeah. And so, what a wonderful time to be in the gospel ministry to the Jewish people, to the children of Israel scattered among the nations. See, the restoration involves Israel. You see, Elijah must come and restore all things. All things what? And how it is written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt but I say to you that Elijah has already come, and they did not, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. Well, if he already came, then why are we still looking for him? He's making reference to John the Baptist, who was beheaded by King Herod. <laughs> They did to him what they wanted. They did to Jesus what they wanted. Is there still a restoration of all things? Yes. Yes. 
So open up your hearts and hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches about this restoration of all things. Because you remember Elisha. Elisha? The servant of Elijah? When Elijah was taken up. Taken up he asked for a double portion of the spirit of Elijah. Yeah. Which brings us back to the spirit. What spirit was in Elijah that enabled Elijah to do the powerful things that he did? The Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, come. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. We put no confidence in the flesh. None. Because the flesh can never, ever fulfill the righteous requirements of Torah. It's impossible for humanity to solve its own problems. If that were possible, we wouldn't need the Messiah to come. The restoration of all things is the working of God who restores all things back to himself and he reconciles all things to himself and he's calling Israel back to himself and only those who hear the word of the Lord through the spirit of God and not through the spirit of this age are going to hear and are going to preach and are going to shout it because we don't have to stay silent anymore because Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen, brother. So pray that God would raise up preachers who prophesy by the Spirit of God. Amen. 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 I'll turn it over to you. I think the Spirit has spoken. Can we say? is short. The return is at hand. And we want <coughs> to encourage each and every one because the Spirit of God is in each of us who have come to believe to be his spokesperson, to take the message. Don't hide it. Don't shrink back. Don't think it takes someone unique or special. Although God says each one of us is unique. We're his peculiar treasure. We are his priests. We are in his holy priesthood. It is for us to spread the word. So may we take the filling of the spirit within us. And may we go by the power of our holy God. Through his spirit. And may we shout it to the mountaintops. And may we speak it in the belly. May we talk of it in our homes. May we talk of it in our workplace. May we talk of it wherever and everywhere God sends us. Because I will remind you all, if you have the Lord in your heart, you are a missionary. And your mission field is right around you. So, beautiful to look forward to the filling of the promises because our God is faithful and every word is kept every promise fulfilled I for one want to spend whatever time I have now in that faithful service and not by my power and not by my might but by the power of the spirit of God We've heard, we've been encouraged, the Spirit has spoken. <coughs> Go. Go. <coughs> Let's close in prayer. We cry out with praise and thanksgiving to our holy God, to Elohim Ha'im, the Most High God. Oh, how I stand in awe that you take a worthless lump of clay and you Bring life to it abundantly, richly, by the power of your spirit within us. 
Truly, you have tabernacled among us, and you are tabernacling within us. Lord God, may we each realize it is not us, it is you in us. But may we be faithful to, to let the Spirit shine, to take and give this precious word, the word of our salvation. Lord God, it is power. And it is power unto all who will receive it, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Use us, Lord, use us. Use us to your glory. Use us to bringing another one in, Lord. Yes. Every day that we stay here, let there be one more brought into the kingdom. And may we all realize that you brought us to the kingdom for such a time as this. Fill us and use us, Lord all to your glory. We praise you and we thank you in your holy name. Amen. 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 Be blessed as you go out in the power and strength of the Spirit within you. We have our Jehovah Father's prayer on us.